Like how does yes. Okay. Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Channel 781 News Debrief. Um this week uh we saw a lot of things happen uh, in the past two weeks. Um and we'll be going over the Moody Street shutdown news. Uh, we'll be going over uh, the public meeting about the farm that happened. Um, the survey results that we talked about uh, in the past uh, that the city put out for 240 Beaver Street came back and was on the docket, as well as the RFPs for not only 240 Beaver Street, but also 92 Felton Street. We'll be mostly talking about 240 Beaver Street, the field station itself. Um, joining me this week is James Kelly's. Hello, everyone. And had been on our show before, but not as a regular participant, Eamon Doss. Hey there. Thank you, Eamon, for coming on. Um, we wanted to bring Eamon on to talk a little bit about the Moody Street shutdown, but I think he'll be staying to talk about the farm as well, which is good because he has valuable insight, and I just crammed the entire meeting into the past two hours, and the meeting was actually four. So I'm very happy to have uh, people on it, watch that meeting in full um, to give their input on it. But we're going to start with Moody Street. So uh, Waltham... Uh, during COVID, along with many other cities in the country, many, many cities shut down part of their city's uh, main street areas or other areas, I don't know what other cities do, um, to vehicular traffic for some portion of time. Uh, Waltham shut down Moody Street uh, for the um, for the summer. Um, they've been doing this past three years. This would be the fourth year. And there was some back and forth on if the city was going to do it or not. And it was recently announced at last week's um, traffic commission, traffic committee, that the mayor will not seek to use her powers to make that happen again. Uh, I'm trying to use my words carefully here. Um, she is not going, she does not think that she has the same powers as before, and she is not going to seek to do use those same powers to shut down Moody Street this year. Um, and so a lot of people are upset about this. Uh, apparently online, some people actually like this. Uh, and um, I think it's just a real shame. Uh, but we wanted to bring Eamon on because uh, in the past couple of years, there's been a, a concerted effort to try and make the closure of Moody Street permanent. Um, in my research uh, on this, I found that while most of these shutdowns of uh, vehicular traffic around the country uh, during COVID, most of them were temporary, some uh, were permanent. And some uh, in San Francisco, uh, for example, in San Francisco, they actually voted on it, um, whether or not to um, make these things permanent um and from what i could find when it did go to a vote a, a every single one i could find was always to close it down permanently um when given the chance um so there was a there was a concerted effort in waltham to make this permanent and Eamon was a part of that coalition so we brought him on to talk about uh what that experience was like um and his take thank you Eamon, for coming on oh thanks chris um so it was kind of a surprise when the mayor brought this up uh, she brought it up at a February traffic uh, commission meeting. Um, you know, she'll normally have a few items to talk to. Um, and, and as she was going through those, she just touched upon uh, Moody Street briefly. It wasn't on the agenda. Um, and she basically said, I have a quote here that um, uh, that with the powers of COVID are gone now, so I don't believe I have any authority to request to close the streets. Um, so she really seemed uh, to believe that her authority to request the closure is tied up um, sort of in the emergency of COVID. Um, I was looking through the traffic rules and regulations. Uh, Article 2, Section 3 says that uh, the chief of police or a few other people uh, may prohibit enclosed streets um, in emergencies. Um, this is really for like if there was a gas leak or if there was maybe if there was like a protest that marched down the street. That's kind of what the intention is there. Um, you know, further down section 13, you know, it does say that the traffic commission has, you know, authority over, you know, the movement or exclusion of vehicles from any streets. So I can, I think I know where she thinks the, um, you know, emergency uh, reasoning comes from, um, but she didn't elaborate further. So I'm not entirely sure um, why she believes that. 
Um, however, I, I know one thing that the, the city believes is that, you know, this is highly popular. I think if you talk to folks, uh, it's, you know, well over 80, 85 percent of people enjoy having Moody Street close to car traffic, um, you know, being able to have outdoor dining, being able to have, um, you know, a, a sort of a calm shopping experience, a place, uh, you know, you can hang out with your children um, or, you know, with friends. Um, it's something that the some of the residents and business owners on Moody Street and some of the side streets are um, they're, they're the ones who likely are more hesitant because it may more impact them more directly. Um, but on the whole, it, this is widely popular. Um, so I was part of a group last summer that uh, asked uh, that we sent out a petition to be able to make this uh, pedestrianization permanent. Um, when we've done this over the past three years, it's always a plan that was put together quickly over uh, just a week or so. And then um, we kind of drag our feet. No one knows if it's gonna happen or not. And then all of a sudden we vote on it in some traffic commission meeting. Um, so having a permanent plan, I think would be able to alleviate a lot of the issues that um, you know the residents and business owners right on Moody Street and the uh, adjoining streets feel, um, as well as sort of give the whole city some closure about, you know, will this happen, will this happen year after year? Um, I think we're still in this um, will it happen? Will it not happen? You know, the mayor has said that um, she will not request this closure, um, but other city councilors are able to request it, you know, and even um, citizens, if they gather enough signatures, are able to do the same. Um, so it is still very much unclear, but the support from the broad public um, would, I, I believe, is to see something, you know, similar, if not improved, um, continuing. Uh, either throughout the summers or a year year round solution. Um, one thing that the mayor mentioned as well is with uh, sort of the state of emergency around COVID being over, um, that there are uh, you know knock on effects with the uh, license commission and the building inspector. Um, she mentioned uh, some things about uh, parking requirements. Um, how if a business uses a a parking lot, uh, the parking space is out front to you know have outdoor dining um you know it may impact their ability to be licensed um you know since licensing for uh you know restaurants and these kind of shops requires some parking um looking at the zoning code and this is article 5.23 um a business c district which is what uh that section of movie street you know between high and pine is zoned for um it says that parking requirements for all uses permitted as of right or by special permit, um, except residential, should not be required for the first 20,000 square feet of gross floor area for structures on individual lots. Um, so I think that parking requirements for lots of the space is just not an issue. Uh, it even goes on to say that seasonal outdoor seating shall not be included in the calculation of parking requirements um, as long as there's fewer than 50 outdoor seats. Um, I, I didn't count what most of the restaurants do. But I do think that it, you know she. I think her concerns about parking may be real, but based on uh, some exclusions that apply um, exclusively to business C districts, which is what Moody Street is in, uh, I, I don't know how many of those would be affected. Uh, I, I did try to get some information about the licensing commission that she mentioned, um, but and anything COVID related there was really to um, you know to their like COVID safety protocols. Um, I, I guess the, the licenses to serve alcohol inside versus outside would be slightly different. Um, but I don't know why there would be a limit one way or the other. I didn't see anything part of the past. So I, I do anticipate in the next uh, month or so that you hear more about a um, sort of campaign to have Moody Street um, just like it was last year over the summer. Um, and now that the mayor is not taking the initiative, um, I, I could see you know a, a, another group uh, stand up to take a uh, either a resolution coming through city council um, or you know a having some uh, consultant or you know project manager come in to see you know what would a permanent solution look like for Moody Street not a will they won't they every year. Yeah, I think both things can be true in that you know I don't even know if if what the mayor is saying uh, is accurate that she doesn't have 
the powers that she had last. It's possible that that is true, but it's also still true that you can shut down Moody Street in a variety of other ways and that she could do that. She's choosing not to. And now it is up to somebody else to take up that mantle. And one thing too, like they say, uh, the mayor says that like she personally can't issue like the, or close the street, but other people that I believe she appoints can, right? Like the director of public works and forestry can. I was just looking at it. Like in several places, it says that they can. Yeah, those are all appointed by the mayor. And like that doesn't require the traffic commission as, as I read this, right? And a lot of this is just sort of seems to be giving reasons why, but it's like reasons that are sort of post hoc justifications for things they didn't want to do anyways, which is a very common refrain. <laughs> I actually emailed a few counselors about this, and out of the all of the ones that I emailed, only a few got back to me. And out of it was um, the Ward Seven, Eight, Nine, and uh, Colleen Bradley MacArthur that were in favor of it, just responding on email. Uh, but like, it would. It, it seems like this is something where like, if it wanted, if like, if this was to happen, right, like it would need to have either be through ordinance. So that it like can just like circumvent the the traffic commission, or just have like people appointed by the traffic commission actually like listen to like what people who live in the city want. Uh, speaking of Eamon, how was signature collecting for you during uh, this campaign? Yeah, it, it it's wicked easy. Um, you know, we have a whole. Um, maybe we'll be able to link the petition in the description or something. You know, but, but we have a whole list of things that, you know, hey, we want better handicap accessibility. We want better, um, you know, signage so that, you know, if you come in an Uber, you know, they know where to drop you off, et cetera. You know, and, and we have all these things that we want. And, and as soon as we say, hey, we just want to, you know, keep Moody Street this way, you know, people don't ask for more details. You know, they, they, that they're really in cards like, this is great. Um, they might be from Waltham. They might have come from someplace else. Um, you know, but th this is something that they want. So, so it's a very easy sell. Um, you know, asking folks for signatures. Yeah, I mean, overwhelmingly, people I talked to enjoyed Moody Street being shut down. I don't think personally, I know any one person that preferred it another way. They do exist. I see them online. I hear, I hear that they exist. Um, but personally, I've never met anyone, and so that anecdotal evidence suggests that a majority uh, support. So good enough for me. Yeah, I, I know at previous traffic commission meetings, um, you know, some business owners that are less retail and restaurant um, oriented, you know, speak up uh, against this. But, you know, if it's maybe a laundromat, you know, they say, oh, people have difficulty, you know, bringing all their clothes here, um, you know, or other uh, type businesses. It, it would be interesting to see if, um, if Moody Street is not, uh, if Moon Street stays the way it is um, for this summer, you know, to be able to do things like compare uh, tax data, um, to be able to say like, hey, yeah. are these businesses, um, are they making more money um, before and after? Um, yeah. I understand looking at 2018, 2019 versus 2020, 2021, uh, COVID may be uh, more of a factor um, mm -hmm. than Moon Street being closed. But I think between uh, 2022 and 2023, I think those years are more similar. Um, so I, you know, it, I would love to see Moody Street uh, pedestrianized again this summer, but if it doesn't happen, we may be able to get some really good data that helps us make better decisions in the future. I'm curious. I'm curious as well to see see that data. Um, moving on to farm things, I think we're going to be talking about the farm for a majority of the debrief now. Um, at the end of the last city council meeting there was uh george darcy brought up the idea uh, not the idea george darcy brought up um the fact that in november he made a request and was approved for a citizen input hearing um to happen before march on the farm because there had never been one to that date and he felt that the city of Waltham residents had a 
right to give their opinion on a public floor about what they would like to see happen to 240 Beaver Street. I'm sure if you watch the show, you understand what's going on with 240 Beaver Street. Um, but the future of that is up in the air right now. Um, and so uh, in the last debrief, um, when we went over it, I basically said that I thought that was going to be the end of it. Um, you know, the the president and the vice president said it was an inappropriate time and they weren't going to do anything about it. Um, and then it was uh, just laid back on the floor. I said I it probably was not, never going to happen and that we weren't going to hear about it again. Um, but uh, very shortly after that meeting, um, it was unveiled that three counselors were co-sponsoring a, a town hall, Colleen Bradley MacArthur, Jonathan Paz, and George Darcy um, at First Parish Unitarian Universalist um, to have an informal um, uh, town hall to give their input. Um, and now, I thought this was very interesting because this was in spite of that meeting. This was... Uh, the counselors that were in support uh, of the idea saying that they thought that the city thinking it was inappropriate at this time, they thought they were completely wrong and they decided to do it anyway. Um, and so I thought it was a very interesting move. You don't usually see that kind of stuff, um, especially uh, just a few days after um, your city council president saying, don't do this. Um, and so I think we were all, we all three of us were in attendance that meeting. I had to leave a little early, um, but I'm curious uh, how you guys felt um, the meeting went. Um, <clears throat> it was, I was trying to keep a list of like who was in attendance that was called out, I believe, uh, in addition to calling Brad MacArthur, Darcy and um, Paz that were sponsoring it, the uh, O'Brien and um, uh, I think Karen Dunn were there as well. Mm -hmm. So, so it was, was uh, Senator Mike Barrett? Oh yeah, Senator Mike Barrett was there too, mm -hmm. who I believe was also involved in the purchasing of the farm. Yes, he was. Yeah. So I think it seemed like he was in, interested in seeing uh, the input session. Yeah, it was an outpouring of support for the farm to remain as it is. Um, many people spoke out uh in favor of that as well as spoke out against the city's handling of the whole situation very confusing uh communications around it uh just a lack of transparency around what they were doing what their plan is uh and just just a lot of people upset with how the mayor handled the entire thing yeah i, I think there's only uh one commenter saying you know that he, he didn't want um, you know, agriculture there. Um, and I think there was one commenter who, who didn't really talk about the farm, but as you mentioned, Chris, sort of communication is like, you, sh you should run against beekeeping um, sort of in, for elections. Uh, apart from that, everyone else was talking about the, uh, the farm and, you know, the type of, you know, farming activities that they wanted to see there. And I would say the vast majority of those wanted to uh, continue um, with the uses that the, the present uh, licensees uh, are engaged in. And also we did record this, it is on our YouTube page. Yes, yes, I should have mentioned that earlier and it's gonna come up, uh, I'm gonna mention it again very shortly, uh, but we were uh, the only news station to record that, um, which is a recurring theme for municipal meetings, not that that was an officially sanctioned meeting. Now, I, I do believe, did Councillor Darcy record that? He, yeah, he, he raised, Yeah, he and, had his phone. Yeah, he often, like, records stuff for his own purposes. I, I don't know why he doesn't put things online more. But, yeah, he, he definitely well was recording some of that, at least. Okay. And, and there was at least one other person um, on the other side of the hall um, who was recording something. Yeah, so so I, I didn't know if... Uh, you know, Councillor Darcy was ever intending to release that, but yeah, you know, he's, he's done this for personal notes. No. He's recorded the, the master plan meetings as well. Yeah, and, and yeah. for personal okay. notes. I actually know that George watches our show, so George, please put this stuff online. People want to see this stuff. Yeah, we need a second angle. Yeah. Also, uh, yeah, for transparency, saying Chris Wrangler was there uh, from Waltham Channel taking photos, so I assume he'll release uh, some, some form of footage uh, from that as well. Um, so moving on to more farm things, the RFP, uh, for 240 Beaver Street was unveiled, um, 
in this most recent committee of the whole meeting. Um, and so Tuesday. this, yeah, uh, on Tuesday, and a majority of the time for that committee of the whole meeting um, was spent talking about that RFP. Um, it was a four hour meeting. Um, and I had two hours to watch the whole thing um, on two times uh, playback speed. Um, and so it is very fresh in my memory. So I think how this is going to work, how this conversation is going to work, is I wrote down just some quick uh, cliff notes about uh, linearly what happened. Um, and I'm going to say that uh, for the people that care about how the progression went. And then uh, we can go back and forth on how we felt the conversation went. And then in that, we'll also want to probably talk about the results of the uh, um, survey, as well as MBTA Communities Act was also brought up as well. Um, so it started with Paul Cates uh, <laughs> upset, uh, the Ward 7 City Council upset that, um, that George Darcy and those other two counselors had a informal meeting that he wasn't invited to until the last minute. Um, George then goes into a, uh, a presentation on that meeting as well as the farm RFP. I thought it was very interesting. If you're curious uh, a little bit uh, about how the meeting went and you don't want to watch the whole thing, I think watching George's uh, presentation is very valuable. It's only a few minutes long. Um, the mayor then uh, talks a little bit about the survey results. Um, and I just have a lot of comments uh, on that. Um, uh, she talks a lot about data and then uh, Jonathan Paz talks a lot about how her data is bad. I thought that was particularly good. I will talk a little bit about that. Um, Paul Kate still is mad about George's comments. Uh, um, Sean Durkee is very upset about the entire thing and uh, wants the RSP as fast as possible, despite uh, the tenants, I wouldn't say necessarily agree with that. Um, Kathy Ann Harris has a big blow up saying that people aren't working together well. And I thought it was very strange. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, and then George has a very strange request uh, to, to bring in someone uh, that knows about Grow uh, into the city council. Um, but it can't be someone that is from Grow because then they would be disqualified from uh putting a application in for an RFP. So it would just be someone that knows a little bit about GROW to come into the city council to talk about GROW because everyone keeps talking about GROW and no one really actually knows uh, what GROW thinks. Um, but it's all incredibly inappropriate because GROW can't actually come in. And so they spent a long time talking about how that was inappropriate, which I actually agree with. I thought that was very strange. Um, and then they go into a little bit about the MUTA Communities Act. Kathleen McMiniman uh, praises uh, the city's plan uh, as this document of just a gold standard on a response to the MBTA. Um, I, 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 I guess, I guess that's how some people feel. I just, I don't know. I read the same plan. That's just not. That's not how I felt. Um, and then they go into the RFP on 92 Felton Street and talk a lot about, um, you know, years ago, like three, I feel like three years ago, two years ago, three years ago, um, we had um, CPA money um, utilized to make improvements on it, and it. Some of it was used to make those improvements, but not all. And then it, it became unclear about how much work needed to be done in the building um, and how much the person that secured the RFP would do uh, versus what the city would do. Um, and then it goes back to the farm. Uh, they have a long back and forth, Conley, Brad and MacArthur and the mayor about uh, like where the line is for what, what needs to be remediated and what the what the city's plan is. Um, and then the mayor goes into a long discussion about uh, her history of um, the farm itself and her administration realizing that there's remediation that needs to be done. And then uh, her response to that, and then her ideal uh, vision for it, which is um, for those that don't know, uh, a lot of the land uh, being used for community garden plots for Waltham residents uh, for some amount of money, um, as well as uh, RFPs for other nonprofits to uh, do whatever they want with it. Um, but everyone, the will they, won't they say Waltham Community Farms, right. they're there's much less space for someone like Waltham Community Farms to 
uh, make an application for the same amount of space. And so if Waltham Community Farms decided to put an application, they would be working with less space. And hopefully we can have someone on the farm come and talk a little bit about that. Or if um, you all have any input on that as well. Um, so did I miss anything it's linearly? Um, linearly, I think you got it. And honestly, my response to a lot of these isn't gonna be that organized, but I think one of the things that kind of jumped out at me with that too was that when Colleen was questioning the mayor, she specifically got her to identify that like the decision to divide the property in half was the mayor's decision. And then I think it was also that it was a lot of this garden plot stuff is going to be run through the CPW running that stuff, which also I just mentioned earlier, like has the authority to close streets and stuff. And mm. it's like in the one hand, we were free to expand the scope of what they can do for this, but not for expand, closing those streets, which kind of struck me. Yeah, Colleen uh, questioned her on like where that line is and like, you know, who decided to make section A and section B a thing. And, you know, the mayor was like, well, you know, there's a mediation that needs to be done on this side and there's some that doesn't need to be done on that side. But really, the line was her decision to make, you know, like there doesn't there does need to be remediation done in section B. Uh, but not all of section b so the line i i agree that it was really the mayor deciding to do that um, as well as the mayor deciding to to make the decision to create garden plots as well you know she's talking a lot about gathering data uh to see who wants garden plots and how how much space is involved in all of these things and uh she you know uses a lot of words to try and defend the idea of it but you know it's her vision for that we can do anything with that land she just she just she decided to make garden plots. one of the things that was a little telling to me on all of this too is that so she sent out the survey to get an idea for how many people would want more garden plots i guess with the idea that there's a long wait list for grow and so while they were sort of discussing that people were trying to like sort of compute like what the total plot space was versus like the area that grow is already using plus the evicted climate experiment space that they would then be hoping to use and it was interesting because like they do this informal survey online to then make concrete decisions about what's get, what gets done with property yeah. and yet they did not include it in the decision making process at all is like the actual data that does exist for like csas that have been getting done by the, the operations on the area and then like does the area that they're giving them support that level yeah is that enough? no it's it's terrifying the fact that the mayor made this made this informal survey that the city pushed out on their social media. And that's it. That's the only place it went. And she's using that to make concrete policy decisions on real life things. And it was like an online survey that like 200 people saw. Um, also, it was interesting because they were then trying to use the rationale that, oh, this is just an informal online survey. People don't expect to see their names publicized. Yeah. And there's like a whole exchange around like, oh, Paul Cates wants the entire list of names of people in attendance of that meeting that we were just talking about the public meeting on the farm. And yet it's a bridge too far for this informal public survey that is being used to make policy decisions should have that publicized. And and, and something else strange about the, uh, the, the, the survey and the mayor's response was at the very beginning, the mayor was talking about the survey results uh, like, you know, 12 people said they were interested in 10 by 12 and, and 10 people said eight by nine. And, and she lists and she lists all the survey results and it says, and then 192 comments, but never really like she talks a lot about the survey um, as people wanting garden plots uh, on that land, but does not acknowledge the vast majority of these comments on this survey were saying we do not want garden plots we want the land to be preserved for waltham fields community farm um, all of these comments are public information and you can find them on if you look at the agenda um on of the city council um i didn't think they were going to become public so it was actually a very 
interesting read through. I'm not sure if anyone thought things were going to be public. Uh, nobody's name is is revealed, as as James just said, but um, you can see uh, the just the vibe uh, for it all, and the vibe is that people are not pleased about this, um, and and so the the fact that the mayor did not acknowledge that. Is, was very telling. And uh, Jonathan Paz, the Ward 9 City Councilor, did a very good job of illustrating why the data was bad because the city was like, hey, you guys interested in garden plots? Like, take this survey. But they didn't ask, like, hey, what do you think should be done with the with the land at 240 Beaver Street? So the data was totally skewed. And the fact that the, the mayor was multiple times brought up this document is is like, a evidence. thing to push her agenda to push her agenda is is terrifying it's, it's not and, and we've talked about it on the show before the, the the way the city of waltham believes they, in they, data conducts data is just like off-putting no well, this is related to the master plan too yeah. and they did mention that master plan input also was had a lot of support for the farm in those meetings yeah. too they brought that up too yeah no Amy, Which, could you yeah you you talked a little bit about this in one of our group chats but could you Sean Durkee said something so outrageous. It was just so funny. Could you could you try and summarize that? Yeah, comment? I don't have his exact quote, but he said that, you know, people had the opportunity to give public input about the farm at uh, master plan meetings. It has been implied that um, there's been no public input on the farm. So through you to the mayor, mayor, have you attended all the master plan committee meetings? Yes, I did. And, and have you been taking uh copious notes as we would say throughout yes, yes so have people brought up the farm and farming and plots and everything and every single and all seven meetings yes they have oh so there has been public input from there has been public input for for this for the farm plots and in the farm yeah. And while that is true, you know, people have the opportunity to give input about anything at those master plan meetings. Yeah, um, I think, they, I think... And, and, and those master plan meetings occurred um, before, uh, you know, and there is talk about the farm, about the uh, environmental remediation, about anything about the RFPs. Um, so, so it does seem a bit, you know, disingenuous to say that people had an opportunity to comment on the farm when they really didn't have an opportunity to comment on the plan. Um, yeah. I, I also think it's, telling that in the current RRPs, there's kind of two styles of agriculture uh, that are being um, sort of allowed. So one is community plots and the other is a CSA farm. And both of those have some sort of, you know, limited use. There are only so many plots available. And likewise with the farm, there's only so many uh, farm shares available. Um, you know, anecdotally, I've heard that the Waltham Fields Community Farm farm shares, you know, sell out and that they are hot ticket items and mm -hmm. that they too have a wait list. Um, so it's interesting to think that um, I, I agree that, you know, if the mayor wants to get data, that seems like, you know, a great thing, you know, to make sure that, um, you know, this agriculture piece of agricultural property, you know, is benefiting all the people in Waltham that want to gain that benefit. But she's only seeing, she's only asking for the unmet demand for one of those parts. Um, mm -hmm. the, as Grow stands now, um, you know, whoever wins that bid is going to have the same amount of space, um, you know, more or less as Grow did to do community farming. Um, however, the CSA farm is going to have severely reduced space. So you would assume that their, the number of farm shares they can offer would also be reduced. And thus, um, there would be a need. Uh, a you know greater need than before. If you also look at the RFPs themselves, um, when you evaluate the, they have some evaluation criteria to sort of rank the maturity of the bids. Um, and when you look at the uh, farm, sorry, but when you look at the 10.71 acres, the CSA, um, it says that. Um, each proposal shall be given a score based on the extent and how the proposal provides CSA shares to local residents and food to local residents and organizations. That's great. Um, but the one for the uh, community plots says that each proposal shall be given a score based upon the extent and how the proposal provides organic community farming plots to local residents, especially those who have no access to a garden. Um, <laughs> so, so it's saying that we want explicitly the community plots to get to those people who don't have access to a community plot at the moment. 
Um, but there is no similar language in the CSA model to say, we want you to be able to provide shares to people who don't have them already. Um, and just the way that they phrase those questions, you know, it, it makes it really clear that, you know, the, the mayor is going in with a plan of, you know, wanting to, um, you know, have more community plots, um, you know, than sort of a, a CSA model. This really reminds me of like the single family zoning approach to, to farming being applied in real time. Where it's just like we want to dice this up between as many people that can maintain and pay for gar personal garden plots. But we definitely don't want to account for people that might want a little bit of CSA shares. And it also doesn't account for um, uh, the RP mentions that it wants to give garden plots to people without access to that kind of opportunity. But it doesn't talk about how people are supposed to get to 240 Beaver Street. <laughs> like, like that is very difficult to get to for the people that generally don't have access to that kind of land, which is the south side. But how do people on the south side uh, get to 240 Beaver Street without vehicular uh movement um and so i agree that those city wall them needs more garden plots but look why take away from uh, a community farm when you could be you know building garden plots on the south side um so that's what i would like to, to see more of um also very interesting uh one thing that the mayor brought up time and time again is that we cannot comment uh so that we the, the, the city mm -hmm. the fact that the 16 of them the 15 councillors and herself you know, cannot comment on the strengths or weaknesses of any of the existing tenants or people who might bid um, because it can really taint the RFP process. But in the survey, she reads the question that she asked. And she says, if you already have an existing plot at 240 Beaver Street with Grow, there is no need to fill out this survey since you are included in their space. And I think that's making a huge assumption that Grow will continue to be at that space. Um, further on, you know, she, the mayor says, I happen to like the way the grow does it. I happen to like the way the grow does it. And that seems to be a pretty strong um, approval <laughs> of one of the potential bidders. And it does seem like someone, it would <laughs> I'd disqualify her at least. <laughs> yes. So for, for someone who makes it, um, I, I, I think that there are, you know, the rules that she calls out are legitimate and I think are important to have sort of a fair and transparent government. Um, but the ability to, you know, ask people about the kind of, you know, how they operate or getting some existing information from um, the existing license, uh, licensees about, you know, how many people do you have? How many of the people that have grow plots are Waltham residents? Um, you know, some information like that may be helpful. Um, yeah. That, that, that is really telling, too, because she was like making a point uh, not to always, even say yeah. the name of Waltham yeah. Field Community Farms, but kept saying grow over and yeah. over again. That was kind yeah. of right, yeah. Um, uh, other anecdotes. Um, I thought it was at the very beginning of the meeting uh, brought up that Paul Cates was super annoyed at the other three counselors for doing a community meeting um, without inviting him uh, properly. Um, I thought that was a strange um, back and forth because you don't usually see Paul being very political and that was him being very political um, about the fact that you know it was inappropriate uh, that he got an invitation like 12 hours beforehand. And when he does community meetings, he invites everyone with plenty of notice, but um, and this is, I guess, this is where we might disagree with me and Paul, but I'm sure Paul understands that this was in response to the city saying that they weren't going to do it and the counselors disagreed and they needed at least an informal uh, meeting about 240 Beaver Street. And so it's not the same thing as a board meeting. And then he makes a, makes a request to get all the people that it spoke and all of the information shared uh, sent to him and any recordings. Um, I just, I, and, vote. yeah. And in a roll call vote, he calls for a roll call vote. And I just, I don't know. I just, uh, do I believe that he doesn't know that we recorded that meeting and that he could just watch the meeting uh, or and was he just doing this for political points? Like I, it I looked like grandstanding. Honestly. Yeah. Yeah. And he's not usually one for grandstanding. So it's, it's not, it's a, uh, it's a bad look for Paul, I think. And I also don't, I also, yeah, I also don't believe him. I would like to be on the record uh, that I don't believe that. So 
you know, Chris, I know, I know you put in some like, you know, public meeting violation requests before. Mm -hmm. um, do you know more about like the cutoff of where it becomes like an informal meeting versus listening session versus, you know, we have a quorum and, and you need something? Do you have any details um, about that? So, so, I mean, that's a very good question. And, um, and it's something I think a lot about and I've asked people. And so what I think is, if more than one counselor gets together with another counselor, they can't make decisions uh, that uh, about any votes that they would take. Um, or I think that's the right wording. I really, I mean, I'm not, I'm not an expert in this. I really shouldn't be uh, opining on this, but I think that is the verbiage. And of course, if it's an official public meeting, then uh, then there has then there's things like quorums and and notices that have to be put out. But in an okay. informal meeting, there are still some things that you have to take into account when a bunch of uh, city councilors get together, even in an informal way. Um, and I think it mostly has to do with like you can't talk about votes that you're going to take and um, or something like that. It's, it's something like that. Really, don't quote okay. me on that. Yeah, I'm, I'm just gonna quote read the the, the letter of the the law quickly because I yeah, have it. Yeah, please. Oh, please. So open meeting law defines meeting as a deliberation by a public body with respect to any matter within the body's jurisdiction. And it uh, defines deliberation as an oral or written communication through any medium, including email, uh, where a quorum of a public body on any public business within its jurisdiction. So I guess if this had already come up before the committee of the whole and a quorum of committee of the whole members were present in this meeting, then that that they were, I guess, running as a meeting and not just participating or just not just being present in, mm -hmm. then it would be. I think it was, it was it would be my understanding. Yeah, yeah I, I believe Colleen and uh, uh, you know that's what Patrick MacArthur has talked. Um, but I I think it was just sort of like a hi, welcome for coming, um, and like you know thank you for your comments, have a good night. Um, I, mm -hmm. I, I really don't think there was much beyond that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm sure. Specify yeah. like anything beyond just like use of the land, which was yeah. also something that people even commenting on were annoyed that it was vague, mm -hmm. which I guess was intentionally so. Yeah, I mean, talk about RFPs and uh, and open meeting law violations. I'm sure the people that made that meeting were very deliberate, especially with George there, who's who's very good at um, knowing these kinds of things. I'm sure they understood what they could and could not say. Um, but also, like, a, out of the um, people in attendance, I don't think they were, they comprised a quorum of any of the existing um, city council committees. And also, that's partly because Paz and Colleen are not on that many, relatively speaking, I'd say. We talked a little bit about it, but but Sean being, like, fake upset that all the holdups with this RFP and how he keeps saying uh, he is the ward counselor which is why it is so upsetting his response. He is the ward counselor of the of the field station. Um, so I don't know if he's trying to be super neutral, but basically what he keeps parroting is that is that the tenants keep saying that they want an RFP as fast as possible. Any slowdowns are just like insulting to them. But all of the tenants that I've spoken to about this and all the tenants that I hear talk about, uh, but no one is saying we want an RFP as fast as possible. They're all saying we we want better communication around this and we're all really upset and we have no idea what's going on and uh, won't please someone help us. Like that's what I'm hearing. And so- Well, the I, only other thing I've heard too is that they want a conservation restriction on the land, which yeah. I think was also part of, I, I need to check more on this, but at least from some of the exchange, it sounded like the, like the way that they were like assessing like how much the rent would be paying was not including like the conservation restriction as a part of like the rent that they'd be paying but then this would be rent that they'd be paying as like a farm so that struck me as like a potential situation where they could end up like with the land being valued for more than like they could probably reasonably make off of it yeah but i don't don't know enough to fully opine on that but like it, that, that was something that i noticed in that exchange <laughs> So yeah, I don't know why Sean, who is the ward counselor, is who should be the who should really be championing this whole thing. The only talking point that he likes bringing up again and again is that he needs to do an RFP as fast as possible. I just don't see it. I don't hear it. I don't see it. Uh, maybe he has conversations that I don't have. Um, I, I forget who it was. It might have been Colleen. Uh, somebody mentioned, you know, what is the process to sort of evict any of the licensees that are there already and, and kick them out once an RFP is 
issue. So I think that can go along, you know, if, if the city had an intention to kick someone out at a certain date, um, you know, then maybe you want RFPs done sooner. Um, I'm trying to remember the conversation about that, but I don't remember that going anywhere. Yeah, no, she didn't want to opine on it because she didn't want to suggest that someone couldn't apply or something. It's just the mayor just being very cautious around saying any actual names or anything. Um, Kathy Ann Harris, I noticed, has been changing her tune. Um, we talked a little bit about her response uh, last time she talked about uh, 240 Beaver Street about how everyone had to have understanding about how this conversation worked and how and how it progressed linearly and that and quote she said quote nobody is taking the farm away about it and now that the RP is out and now that it's become clear that the farm at least some of it is going somewhere it's going somewhere else and so the farm is not going to be as intact and so now Kathy Harris who has always been a very big supporter of the farm, uh, now she has changed her tune and now she's saying, well, we need to work together and this is going to be a hard conversation and uh, we need everyone, uh, you know, to understand. And so it's just, it's just, I've it's noticed, it's interesting me noting the difference in her tone and what she's been saying now that the city may be cutting into the farm more than she had intended. And now she's not really, I would say, championing it as much as she used to be. Honestly, this whole exchange too really made a lot of the, like the discussion of like the the contamination kind of feel like such a sideshow that just consumed time because like nobody was contesting that and it was just then it all just sort of boils down to oh this is about farm plots and wanting to maximize the amount of space for for hypothetical farm plots in the future mm -hmm. or garden plots rather I should say yeah. It, it, the the language is interesting there. Um, as I pull it up here, um, you know, the language isn't for garden, it's for organic community farming plots. Hmm. It does say organic community farming plots, especially those who have no access to a garden. So, so I don't, and, and I don't know what Grow's model is. So I don't know if it's um, supposed to be agriculture based or it can just be, you know, like flowers. Um, I, I don't know if there's a one way or the other. Uh, I guess they use maybe maybe that language is interchangeable. But I don't know much. At least one of the things I recall them talking about too was that like the the section two area that. Uh, the, 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 the section two area that was getting like uh, was under discussion that wasn't going to be used for the section one area, which is what the CSA thing is. They had mentioned that I guess through the. Um, the CPW. Uh, public works you could get more of that to work with if you needed to so if either for more garden plots or for more csa but there wasn't any real clarity on like what that would process would be or what that would be the mean but that was mentioned also discussed during this meeting was the ndta community act um we talked a little bit about the city's plan that was unveiled uh but this was the first opportunity for the city council uh to opine on it as well um and it was a short conversation, mostly Kathleen McMiniman speaking. Um, James, you've been taking up a lot uh, of time of your time uh, invested into this. Do you? How did you feel that conversation went? Uh, so the practical upshot is that there's going to be a lot of uh, the city solicitors spending time in ordinance and rules going over this. Um, it, it sounds like they're planning on like at least from reading the, the the plan that they submitted it's going to be uh attempting to like increase the density of some of the already more dense zoning areas of waltham and it doesn't seem like there's any i didn't see any indication that they're going to be doing anything to address like, like car oriented uh, development in any of the other sort of zoned areas and i think we're gonna have to sort of wait and see what they have to say about it in the ordinance and rules meeting because uh, there wasn't much meat there on this one yeah, it, it's very interesting. In, in the first line of the action plan, you know, they say pretty clearly uh, that uh, the state mandate requires 3,982 multifamily units um, within a half mile of a commuter rail station. And that Waltham has 5,548 multifamily units within a half mile of the commuter rail station. Um, so, so we have enough units. It's really just a question of density and just not allowing that by right. Um, you know, and they talk about lots of things that they've done to, you know, 
have multifamily housing or um, you know have affordable housing, um, but they never really seem to get back to the point that it's mostly a zoning issue. So they talk a lot about um, you know where they need to add housing um, and sort of at the uh, very end of somewhere, like they asked the city engineer, what would be the impact if, you know, we added, you know, 4,000 homes or what would the impact on the schools be if we added, you know, 4,000, uh, I say 4,000, the, the 3982 number. Um, and then that just seems to be disingenuous because, you know, we have the housing already. Um, we just don't zone for it. Um, I feel like it's kind of like, you know, asking someone who's 30, 31 for ID when they first sell them. You know, it, it, the issue isn't that you're, you know, you're not old enough. The issue is that you just don't have ID. Um, also, I think it's worth like clarifying exactly what it means when it's like these things are not zoned for it. Because like, like I live in a building that's in an area that's a residence to be, I believe, and like it couldn't get rebuilt the way that it is. And it's not because the building is particularly bad. It's because it doesn't have enough car parking spaces. And that's like kind of the root of the problem here. <laughs> And also offsets from the street and yard space. And it, it's also like related to like the density thing. I think McMinnon brought up several developments for like seniors and stuff as, as if they should be included in the consideration here. And pretty much all of them were over two to three miles away from any of the commuter rail stations and like would require walking down Lexington Street to get to it, which is notoriously unfriendly to pedestrians with when it's not snowing. When it yeah, is snowing, very it's sidewalks. terrible. Yeah. You know? That's like the level of consideration it feels like is being given to mass transit in the city, and it's not much. Um, something I learned uh, from that, though, is that there actually was a inner city municipal bus program um, that ultimately failed due to lack of ridership. I know nothing about that. I would love to learn more um, and see why it failed and uh, and what could have been done differently and what we will do differently when we do decide to do this again, because that is what I would really like to see happen. Um, I guess the question uh, is, where is that currently, the Communities Act, as well as the RFP on the farm? Um, what is happening with it currently? So the Communities Act is in the ordinance and rules, I believe. Did that, I, that got sent to ordinance and rules? It's in both. So it's in it's in committee of the whole and it's an ordinance of rules. Is, I believe how they did that. So, so, so be, it's, so it's that, sat on the table uh, during that meeting and it's also in ordinance and rules. Okay. And, the, and the solicitor will be going to ordinance and rules to talk about it for the go, for the future. And I don't think it's going to be in the next meeting, but the meeting after was, I believe, what the scheduling was. And the farm as well. Um, Eamon, do you understand what's happening with that? What is the next step for that? So the mayor presented the RFPs, and it seems like the city council has an opportunity to uh, discuss, um, but there really wasn't any opportunity to discuss at, at the meeting. Um, so I, I'm not sure where that is and, you know, who needs to... Uh, approve that RFP before it's sent out. Um, may, maybe that's something that has to go now back to uh, the full council. Um, yeah, no vote I, was taken was, on it though. So no. Um, so, so it's definitely still on the floor. I just don't know when the next thing is. What what happens to it? But I guess the conversation will continue. I guess is that is the uh, takeaway. Is that this is not being done talked about. Um, and yeah, George did make a couple of edits to the RFP itself, so um, there'll definitely be more opportunity to talk about it. I will say that um, looking at the purchasing department, you know, there was a successful bid for the environmental remediation. Um, so that well, is going forward. And, and I think in, in part of the language that bid, um, you would have to take care of uh, the remediation within 90 days. Um, so I don't know the timeline between getting a bid and letting them start work, um, but it is, you know, that, that's firmly underway. I did not know that. I'm glad, I'm glad you just brought that up. The last thing uh, that we'd like to touch upon is uh, ordinance and rules also met. We talked almost exclusively about Committee of the Whole, but there were several meetings that took place, and we're going to talk a little bit about ordinance and rules, and James was kind enough to view that in full. Uh, so James, please take it away. 
there was some i'd say at this point normal business which is to say like pot shops and license renewals or sorry not license renewals that's a different one uh but the thing that jumped out at me was they had a zoning change for farms a zoning change amendment for farm stands which was i guess for the recreational like whatever use zoning they wanted to make sure that it would have because i guess it doesn't include like you, you can't like set up a farm stand under our current zoning but because this was previously owned by the state it was superseding that zoning so this is I don't, I don't think it's meant to be anything blocking but it sounds like they're just trying to sort that out and uh the other thing that jumped out at me that was interesting was uh right at the end of the meeting uh insert or uh i want to get the wording right on this it was uh they they were getting single family zoning ordinance language drafted by the law department and this is a follow-up from what i understand to the uh, single family zonings or discussions that have been ongoing about uh, not wanting college dorms ending up around in, in the single family zone parts of Waltham. And so I have to imagine this is related to like enforcement and sort of saying that like, mm -hmm. if, if you do not conform to this in this area, you're going to get some sort of negative thing. Yeah. Uh, so that's kind of where I think that's going. Also, I think it's interesting this sort of happening simultaneously with the MBTA Communities Act trying to densify parts of Waltham yeah and, and city not being uh, playing ball there and also interesting uh anecdote as well uh at the same time all of that is happening um brandeis as well there are a couple of student organizations that are organizing around the issue as well um uh, brandeis leftist union uh my friends there uh being the main one uh making a list of demands that they would like to see brandeis do and it's really uh they're trying to link um the housing supply of Brandeis to the number of students accepted. Um, I think everyone can agree that Brandeis is accepting too many students and not enough housing, and it is pushing the students into the uh, to acquire the housing stock of Waltham. And a lot of the time, uh, them and their parents' money uh, is able to accept a higher uh, rate than the working class of Waltham, which pushes rents up. And so I think everyone can agree that Brandeis is doing that. Um, but I think the solutions are interesting. Some people pressure Brandeis um, to build more housing, and some people want to make it illegal to have roommates in single family zoning. Like that, uh, the, to make the cognitive dissonance to jump to that conclusion, to, to, make, to, make, it, to make the city able to, to essentially legislate who can live with who, uh, is is frightening to me, and it's 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 a slippery slope. Um, and so I'm curious to see what definition John McLaughlin and the law department comes up with. Yeah, I, I know. Um, you know, this whole Channel 781 News project was started because you know you said that you lost the we lost our local paper in Waltham. Uh, but that's mm -hmm. not entirely true. That Brandeis has the justice. Um, mm -hmm. You know, which I know recently reported on um, high enrollment and you know crowding in dorms. Mm -hmm. um so I, I i follow it it is a good resource to you know because well you know as i know you said chris waltham is brandeis brandeis is waltham um you know so, so you know their issues affect us especially as it comes to these things so i'm surprised you remember that little thinking of a speech of mine it, it, it was a good snippet yeah i said it at a rally just recently <laughs> at brandeis um shout out justice by the way <laughs> Um, okay, that's going to do it uh, for us. Um, we will still be talking about the farm because I think it's still going to be a big thing. Um, but we will be back next week to talk about the full city council and any resolutions and fun things that come up. So thank you, Eamon, for coming on and uh, chatting this entire time. And James, thank you again for always uh, diving deep into these meetings. Um, and we'll see everyone next week. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Bye, everyone.